I would like to welcome Marnie Wilking, CISO, Global Head of Security and IT Risk Management at Wayfair. Marnie, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Leah, for such a nice introduction. I'm so excited to be here today with the Trend team and so honored to be included. The content today has been amazing. I always appreciate Eva's insights and I have certainly learned a lot from everyone. So we talked a lot today about risk mitigation in the face of new threats and new environments. And as Eva pointed out, our broadened and evolving attack surfaces. And of course, there's a shortage of skilled people to help identify those threats and defend the new cloud environments. And we as cybersecurity leaders are expected to communicate threats and vulnerabilities and risks across a wide spectrum of people in the organization, from the engineers who need to do the remediation to the executive leadership and board who want to understand the impact and the governance. It's no wonder we CISOs are exhausted. <clears throat> like many of you, I have experienced those things in the midst of a digital transformation to the cloud and hyper-COVID growth. I'll share more about our story, but first, here's a little bit of information about Wayfair. Our digital platform supports more than 27 million active customers, over 23,000 suppliers who provide more than 22 million catalog items through our supplier-facing applications. We support more than 16,000 employees, which includes 3,000 engineers in six cities across three countries and our own in-house customer service agents across the US, the UK, and Germany. From a warehouse perspective, we have 18 fulfillment centers and 38 delivery centers across the UK, Canada, US, and Germany. We also operate e-commerce sales and delivery to customers in those four countries. And just in case you didn't know, Wayfair is actually made up of five distinct brands. There's Wayfair, but also Paragold, our luxury brand, and Joss and Main, All Modern, and Birch Lane. So there are more sites than you thought to go furniture shopping. And this year we'll be launching physical stores for All Modern and Joss and Main. So soon you'll be able to shop in person. Wayfair's digital transformation to improve customer experience in e-commerce started many years ago with enhanced imagery and in-room view options and increased inventory options. We really started to become cloud forward in 2018 when we partnered with GCP to enable smoother ramp up during big events like Way Day and holiday shopping. And we took advantage of Google's big data capabilities to support faster data-driven decisions. And it worked. In 2019, after migrating consumer sites to GCP, that holiday shopping period, affectionately known as Cyber 5, required a lot less effort to increase capacity and supported the increased traffic and order volume with very little hands-on effort. So there are a lot of companies who have been or have been native to or have been moving to public cloud infrastructure for several years, but certainly during COVID, for a lot of companies, <clears throat> that migration became necessary or accelerated to meet demand. COVID accelerated a lot of transformation timelines, including Wayfair's. We'd already begun our cloud journey, but in 2020, when we were really gearing up our digital transformation, COVID hit, sent everyone home, and suddenly everyone decided they really didn't like the couch they were sitting on, or that they needed outdoor play sets to keep their kids busy, or office furniture to work better. The number of visits to our sites and apps nearly doubled and order volume increased by 62% year over year from 2019 to 2020. The shift to Google Cloud for those consumer workloads worked great. We were able to accommodate that sharp increase in volume and we celebrated the cloud transformation for consumer had been really successful. Did I mention that we provide supplier interfaces? That provides not only the update to the ability to update and upload inventory, but also the images that are associated with that inventory, the end-to-end -end logistics for those suppliers to ensure that their products get to our customers. There was a big increase in orders, which included a big increase in suppliers and a big increase in inventory. And we realized that the fulfillment processing and supplier interfaces needed to be able to scale and flex just as well as the consumer interfaces, because we needed to support those additional orders and suppliers wanted to provide more inventory so that customers can make their homes more beautiful. And we'd already begun the projects around building out the physical retail stores. So we knew we needed a resilient way 
to support the growing order and delivery volume, support the physical store build, and to address our growing attack surface. So we needed a way to quickly move from our on-prem data centers to Google Cloud without derailing our engineers, our employees, our customers, our supplier partners, or our business initiatives. We partnered very closely with Google Cloud to create a strategy that included both transformation to decouple and containerize applications that were ready and to do a lift and shift for applications that needed more time but could still benefit from the cloud capabilities. We have fully leaned into hybrid cloud model, which helps us support additional suppliers, additional demand, more inventory, more orders around the world while maintaining compliance where necessary and flexibility for specific functions like call center where possible. From an endpoint security standpoint, we were already investing heavily in zero trust as an initiative. At the start of the push to work from home, we were able to speed up a few of those projects to get employees up and running from home with very few hiccups. That accelerated the work overall as we doubled down on identity as the perimeter, working really closely with our engineering teams to prioritize applications that could be decoupled to use MFA as opposed to requiring the VPN connection, connectivity, which eventually reduced the load on the VPN overall and the engineering teams were able to focus on performance for those applications that still required VPN, overall accelerating our digital transformation. Of course, with digital acceleration comes risks. I have heard everything about the cloud. It's scary because there's no security or the cloud does all of the security for you. The, the truth is obviously in between, but it is a very different way of doing things. The old adage, what got you here won't get you there is very true as you move along the digital transformation journey. Calvin alluded to this as well. We are always changing. Your move to the cloud requires a different way of thinking about your environment and your attack surface and how you find and manage your assets and vulnerabilities. We realized that our hybrid model that had been working pretty well was gonna to have to very quickly scale up in the cloud, still maintain the visibility in our data center, even while we were migrating things out of the data center. So how would we know what functions and servers were moving where and when, and how would we make sure that we could enable security tools and licenses in the cloud as applications were being moved or redesigned for containers? And in addition, we understood that there were new risks to being in the cloud and being hybrid. The users really are your perimeter, so identity verification and access management become key security controls. And as Chris LaFleur said earlier, we all know that users can be susceptible to phishing, which makes controlling and monitoring credentials and access even more important. Shadow IT can become more prevalent when engineers have more access to cloud and all employees have access to SaaS applications. Accelerating developer velocity is a key win for cloud migration and is great for the developers and business, but it can result in missed security controls if the proper guardrails and checks are not in place. I think you're all probably familiar with the NIST risk management framework. I put it here because regardless of your industry or maturity, it's a great place to start. A, a couple of our guests have talked about making risk management a continuous process. So I think it's important to point out that the NIST framework is a cycle. It was built that way intentionally because risk management is not a one-time exercise, even and especially in the cloud. Also, it's important to leverage any risk management in the context of your people, your processes, and your technology. David Chow talked about this earlier. You have to assess what you have in each of those areas and ensure you're maximizing the value and input in each area, but compensate where you need to. Many of us are struggling to get the people we need. And depending on the maturity of your program, you may or may not have all of the processes in place that you need. So we may be relying more on partners and tools, that technology piece, to help us get visibility into our assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. And we need those tools and partners to be efficient. I will go back to my previous comment about what got us here won't get us there. 
we can't do things the same way we've been doing them for the last 10 to 15 years in security. Those tools and partners that you have in your arsenal that have worked for you for the last 10 to 15 years may not be the right tools and partners in your new cloud environment for identifying assets, protecting your data, detecting attacks, and being resilient enough to recover. Thankfully, there's a lot of innovation in this space. For one, the DevOps and rugged DevOps movement that Leah and David mentioned earlier has led to a lot of automation. If we can have configuration as code and infrastructure as code, then we can have security as code built into the configuration and infrastructure. Remember, we heard from Mila earlier that a significant number of exploits are a result of misconfigurations. We leveraged automation tooling like Terraform to ensure security tools and policies were built into our cloud deployment so that as applications were migrating to the cloud, regardless if it was a brand new deploy or a lift and shift of an application, the underlying security tools and compliance configurations are built into the deployment through that automated tooling. We also leverage both native cloud capabilities and tool capabilities to continuously look for misconfigurations so that we can find ways to quickly remediate and mitigate those issues. We all struggle with visibility and understanding how many and where our assets are, and that problem seems to grow exponentially with the cloud. Thankfully, there are new companies and new products from existing companies that will provide not just the visibility you need into your assets and vulnerabilities and misconfigurations, but also provide the prioritization for addressing those issues. Jeremiah, sorry, Jeremiah spoke earlier about continuous discovery. As we all know from recent events like Log4j, zero-day vulnerabilities are not going away and they can be a big surprise and have a huge impact. We need to have the right tools and processes to find and remediate or mitigate those issues. Developers have the ability to deploy so many more assets and code, and they might inadvertently reintroduce vulnerabilities that you thought you'd eradicated. The ability to do continuous discovery of both assets and vulnerabilities with the prioritization of issues will support your ability to remediate and mitigate those that present the most exposure not necessarily the ones that are the highest rated. Focusing on the ones that create the most exposure and the most risk frees up time for your team and the developers to focus on the creation, not the cleanup. Our Zero Trust framework has provided the framework and controls we needed for identity and device validation as a perimeter. Our strategy is to ensure that all employees have access to all of the things that they need to do their jobs from wherever and whenever they need it, as long as we can make access decisions based on our confidence in the identity and the devices. That has really accelerated our ability to provide more access while managing the attack surface associated with end users. And at Wayfair, we've leveraged a combination of cloud native security capabilities, along with partners and tools who are cloud first or cloud forward. Having a partner who knows and understands the differences in asset structure and attack surface in the cloud can have a big impact on your ability to not only quickly detect and respond to an incident, but prevent the incident in the first place. Ultimately, my job really is to manage risks in a way that allows the business to move as fast as it needs to move, whether that's by design, or because everyone is suddenly working from home and decides to order office equipment all at the same time. Leah mentioned earlier that many leaders feel that they don't really understand cyber risk. In order for us to support business velocity and manage risks at the same time, there are two things I recommend. One, really understand the business and ask and understand not only where they think the risks are, but also where there might be inappropriate friction. And don't just communicate the risks to the business, Dis discuss the risks with the business. Identify where you think there might be issues and then ask them what they think about it. Do they agree? If they do, then the conversation gets to turn to how do we address this? If they don't agree that that's a risk, they get to explain why. And you might learn a lot about the business when you ask that question. 
They also might not understand the new risks of the new cloud environment. You can have great conversations with your tech and business leaders by working with them to model the threats and understand how the business flows work and understand the risk tolerance of the business. Give them options that might include both prevention and detection techniques for managing and mitigating risks. We as security professionals often go straight to prevent, but sometimes a prevention technique can introduce too much friction for the business. Sometimes it may be necessary to leverage detection to reduce the friction and then enable you and the business to learn more about the risks in the process. And secondly, know where you have visibility to your assets, vulnerabilities and threats, and where you don't. Understand what capabilities are available in whatever environment you're in, where, where you were using one tool on-prem, maybe during your digital transformation, that tool may not work. So maybe you can augment that tool in the cloud with some cloud native capabilities while you're looking for the best tools and partners. Do a tools inventory to determine if the tools you've been using are going to be able to give you the visibility to your assets and attacks, or if it might be time to move to something more, more appropriate for your new environment. Digital transformation, especially done at a high rate of speed while also trying to keep the lights on and add new features at the same time, can be intimidating and exhausting. The cloud is not scary, but it will come with new risks for your business. If you understand your business's priorities and what you currently have and don't have, you can obtain the tools and partners you need to plan for your own security transformation and communicate those risks in a way that will support the business while also providing you with the technology and processes and people to manage those risks. Thank you again for having me. This was very fun. And now I'll send it back to the studio.